John is um, um, uh, a scientist uh, uh, trained uh, um, uh, well, a number of places here. We'll get through his, his bio. He's currently a consultant with uh, Abacus Bio, uh, an agri-science and, and business company based in, in New Zealand. Uh, until recently, John was uh, based in uh, Edinburgh uh, office, um, but had the opportunity to uh, move back to the North American side and grow, grow the business uh, over here. Um, so he recently moved back to uh, Alberta, um, where he spent several years after completion of his PhD. Uh, as you'll notice here in just a moment, John's from Ireland um, and um, grew up on a mixed dairy and beef operation there, which is a pretty common production system. Um, he received his PhD in animal breeding and genetics in 2010 uh, from the University College Dublin uh, and Chagas. And uh, John's current work focuses on many aspects of genetic improvement across plant and animal species, the sustainability of food and fiber production, and the application and evaluation of emerging agri-technologies. Um, we had the pleasure uh, last fall in our uh, animal breeding uh, National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium um, uh, Brown Bagger Series, which is a train the trainer program for extension professionals that Matt Spangler and Dare Bullock and I lead, um, to have John on to talk about um, uh, environmental impact and, and selection index. And uh, he did a great job and he's gonna do a great job this morning um, as he's kind of uh, uh, becoming known for kind of one of the principal scientists working in this area. Um, and so John, welcome. Uh, we look forward to your comments. Thanks, Bob. Um, and also thanks to BIF for the invite and to the local committee for, for organizing the few days. Um, feel a bit like the Minister for Finance on Budget Day in a recession talking about uh, environmental impacts when, when there's lots of other pressures on beef production at the moment. But today I'll talk about fitting environmental impacts into selection indexes. Um, so it's good to follow on from Rory's talk because he's introduced a lot of the, the drivers for why we're looking at breeding and, um, and breeding and genetics as a solution for um, tackling climate. Uh, climate, um, I suppose, the responsibilities when it comes to beef production. Um, so Bob would have tasked me with talking a little bit at a higher level. I have another technical talk tomorrow afternoon, so we'll kind of keep this high level, but just to generate discussion about how we actually think about putting environmental sustainability into our breeding goals or our breeding objectives, and more specifically, maybe what traits, what are the traits that would drive improvements in greenhouse gas footprints when it comes to um, beef production? Again, Rory went through a lot of this. I'll, I'll focus on the greenhouse gas aspect of sustainability or environmental impacts when it comes to beef production. Um, water use, land use change, biodiversity would be two, three, and four on, on that list. So you can kind of wrap your head around a lot of the approaches to greenhouse gas. Um, we could also replicate those when it comes to, to water efficiency or, or biodiversity, et cetera. Um, we'll, we'll talk about breeding and genetics. As one of the solutions, again, Rory had a list of a few different ways we can approach it. Um, it's not to be to, to, to not be cognizant of some of the management practices that are coming out and um, would be remiss. So lots of feed additive products being developed at the moment, tree and OP being quite um, a promising one. You know, things to be careful of there is the, the microbiome has evolved and, and been in place for for centuries and tinkering with that, it's a symbiotic population in there with the protozoa, archaea and the fungi, et cetera. So to be tinkering with it, we have, we have to be careful with that. Again, it's for any trait, we have the management side and the genetic side. So I'll talk about the genetic side, a coarser management. For average daily gain, we could just pump our animals full of um, high value, high energy feed to get them to where we want to go, but that's never economically viable. So we, we use genetics and selection to to get to where we want to go. Um, I'll just keep an eye on my own time. So there's been a lot of methodology improvements, advancements, and thought in this over the last number of years, especially as all the commitments come on board, consumer pressures, et cetera. So just wanted to throw up a few snapshots of a few papers that are relevant to this genetic and genomic selection for, for methane mitigation. Um, economic weights and, econo and and carbon coefficients inside and selection indexes. I think these slides are available afterwards, so you can have a look through these papers. They're, they're quite good ones to, to look at. Well, a question I would get is, what's the potential of genetics as a mitigation tool when all the feed additives are coming on board and, and, and lots of other um, 
you know, management faculty are coming on board, where does genetics fit? This is a, a, a marginal abatement cost curve. It's from Ireland. It's um, the, the Irish version of USDA Chagas, and they would have looked at all the mitigation strategies for greenhouse gases in Ireland for agriculture and seen where the potential lies and what should um, they chase after when it comes to, to research and development and, and further extension and deployment. On the x-axis, you'd have the magnitude of mitigation potential for CO2. So the wider the bar, the more potential it has, to, the more potential that practice has to mitigate greenhouse gas. And on the y-axis, or on the y-axis, then you have the cost of implementing that measure. So anything that's a negative cost is actually cost beneficial. More to do with improving production efficiency or profitability, and you um, improving production efficiency and profitability. So you get. Um, a negative cost in that because you're actually getting revenue from implementing the measure as well as greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, the first four, the first three bars there are to do with genetics. It's also including dairy genetics. And I'll refer to dairy throughout this as well because they're the pieces or they're the industries that we've been working in most with this uh, approach. So improvements in live weight gain, beef genomics, dairy selection indexes, they actually take up a massive chunk of greenhouse gas mitigation from all levels of agriculture in Ireland. So it'd be interesting to do this when it comes to US beef or US agriculture, where does genetics lie in, a, in the, the relative um, importance as a solution to, to reducing greenhouse gases? And it, it's a good one to do, and it'll inform a lot of policy and, and research direction in the future. I tried to look for something similar in the US. This is the best I could come up with. Um, you have the, uh, along the columns there, um, the latter four columns, you have the potential um, methane and nitrous oxide mitigating impact or effect, the effectiveness of it, and the recommendation around it. And the, the, the bottom four there, genetic selection, feed efficiency, animal health, which can be tackled through breeding and genetics, reduce animal mortality, and, and reduce age at harvest. They all deliver or they all hold a lot of promise in reducing the greenhouse gas footprint of beef um you know they've all low potential for mitigating but they all kind of stack on top of each other so while each individual measure is quite low cumulatively you're probably getting towards a medium or a high potential for for mitigating greenhouse gases through through genetics and improving those specific traits i'll, I'll go down a rabbit hole for two seconds uh, just away from the the activity of putting greenhouse gas inside in, uh, our, our breeding objective. So Rory talked about a lot of the drivers that have this topic on our agenda at the moment. Just w one huge driver that I'm seeing at the moment and a lot of what I get asked, um, the cons consumers are, policy is gonna drive it, but consumers are also gonna drive a lot of this. Um, packers are already working on frameworks and how to, for their responsibility on how to source somewhat verify greenhouse gas efficient animals um, and it also can you know if you're improving your animals at the greenhouse gas level it can also act as a point of difference either between producers you can get you know if the the trading is set up correctly you can get premiums for low greenhouse gas animals and also as a genetics exporting nation a lot of different countries are going to be looking at your genetics and seeing what metrics you have on your animals or on your genetics for greenhouse gases. I just want the rabbit hole I want to go down is the consumer piece. And that's a tweet there from earlier in the year from a from an Irish uh, uh, parliament member. Um, and the tweet reads, ignore for a moment the eye watering prices in Dublin. Look at the CO2 labeling. Would this influence what you order? So I downloaded the, the, the menu. So would this influence what you order? So this is a well known um, gastro pub chain across Ireland and the UK. And the little legend up there in the red box, the little cloud says the carbon emitted in the production of this dish. So the first three there are hamburgers. The, the fourth one is lamb. The latter two are chicken. That's what a consumer would see when he goes into the restaurant and they sit down and I don't know what I want today. Let's have a look. So look at the huge difference between what chicken is, or the carbon footprint of the dish that's about to be put in front of somebody versus the beef burger. Massive difference. Would it, if somebody wasn't, didn't have a totally 
you know, a massive affinity for agriculture, wasn't tied to the land or wasn't a, a country kid inside in the city, I bet you this would drive a lot of consumer choice. If we look across the way to plant-based dishes, there's hardly no carbon footprint on those plant-based dishes. Now, energy content, calories, grams of protein and all these dishes is totally absent from this. You can see this big chain is driving, um, driving, you know, consumer decisions through greenhouse gas footprints on every dish. Those veggie dishes are practically carbon free, which is a total lie. So another thing with speaking to the interest groups in the room today and whether it, you know, we, we talk about things we can do on the ground, but also at the policy level, you know, proper calculations and proper vetting. This mightn't be in North America yet, but proper vetting of um, labeling like this needs to be um, high in the agenda of the interest groups for the Beef Association. We do have a little, uh, when we talk about selection objectives, the conundrum that we come up against is what do we want to do at the end of the day? Do we want to reduce gross emissions or do we want to improve emissions intensity? And in Rory's talk there, he put up a little goal in the Canadian side of things and one of their goals is reduce or improve emissions intensity and emissions intensity would be the amount of emissions per kilo of product or per kilo of, of carcass. Um, and that's the right one to go for, I think. Um, gross would be a literal reduction in the amount of carbon coming from a farm or coming from an animal itself. So if you select for gross emissions reduction, you're probably going to end up hammering your production traits. So lower size of your animal, lower days on feed, um, and you will end up with lower kilos of carcass produced per year per state, per farm, uh, per nation. And the conundrum is policy is probably wanting to get at a reduction in gross emissions. But the conundrum is, especially in North America, where relatively the emissions intensity is quite good for beef production, that if that is put in place and you have to chase gross emissions, you'll get what we call carbon leakage. And that's the reduction of beef production in this part of the world. And it needs to be supplemented from another part of the world because global demand isn't going anywhere. And the other parts of the world probably produce it less carbon efficiently than here. So that's why emissions intensity is the way to form your selection objective. What you initially want to do or what you really want to do is reduce the amount of carbon needed or the, the, reduce the emissions per kilo of, of beef. So, you know, if this is to be implemented, emissions intensity is the, is the way to go. The, the reason there's um, two guys there in the left hand picture is a lot of agreements just talk about reducing the, the overall number. And that, that's, I hope policy doesn't filter down at the local level or the, the, the applied level that they will chase gross emissions. It needs to be done with cognizance of the, the level of output from any country. Genetic improvement generally, without even doing anything to your selection objective, general genetic improvement um, in the North American beef herd is probably doing a good job of improving emissions intensity. So by definition, you're probably lowering your carbon footprint by really doing nothing at all. Improving profitability, improving production efficiency through genetic selection is doing a good job for the carbon footprint of the nation. Um, that That is so. So you could continue with the way you're doing, but that would be so... Um, you know, if the cow herd say is stable and production increases through because of genetics, then you're improving your emissions intensity. A bigger win would be, and Rory mentioned this, less animals is a huge win when it comes to improving a greenhouse gas footprint. So if you can through improve genetics, production efficiency increases, the amount or the kilos of beef produced per year, if that stays the same and doesn't go up, if that stays the same, you actually can reduce the amount of cows needed to produce X kilos of beef. So production doesn't go anywhere, but the cow herd is able to reduce, and that's a, a massive saving. Um, and you know that, that would have to come into play if there was quotas involved in, in, in beef production, which I don't think will go on, which I don't think will happen. Um, improving emissions intensity or improving uh, genetics at the moment is fine. And it's probably reducing the greenhouse gas footprint. It will start to creep up though if the herd starts to increase with it. The emissions intensity would have to improve at an awful lot quicker to mitigate any um, 
any new introduction of, of extra animals into the national herd. So th that was just one caveat when we we're talking about genetic improvement. The second one is, and it, it'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it after this, is our narrow focus on gases can actually be detrimental. We talk a lot about enteric methane. Um, if you actually look at a whole system, focusing on just one gas can actually pull the emphasis away from that gas, but it can introduce a lot of other gases. So a, a very obvious example of this. So looking at direct traits, looking at methane as a selection criteria, that's fine. That won't really introduce any negative connotations. But if you look at it through indirect traits, say like calving interval, if you actually model a life cycle assessment of beef, you increase your calving interval, What's actually happening on paper from a carbon accounting point of view is you're reducing your carbon footprint. So calving interval gets worse, but you improve your carbon footprint. How does that happen? It's actually to do with the accounting of it because you have less animals on the ground. You have less animals being born within a time period or a time boundary. So just looking at methane actually does you a disservice because what happens in the background is you need to bring in more feed to feed that cow for an extra day of maintenance around breeding. And bringing in more feed is a, a big carbon cost, a CO2 cost. So I could probably just put up this slide and that would be the whole talk, but Bob said I had to fill half an hour. So I'll go through these. So breeding for the environment. There's a few different ways we can tackle this. One I kind of mentioned already is continuing with current efforts. It'd be great if we could quantify for North America what current efforts are doing. Genetic improvement has a trend over time. What's the coefficient of that trend in a selection index, in, in multiple traits? What's the impact of that trend on a reduction in carbon um, at, at the national level? It's probably going in the right direction. It'll be great to quantify it if somebody had a, had a spare afternoon. Another one is to, and these can stack on top of each other. They're not in any order. They can exist by themselves. Another one is to uh, introduce new selection criteria. So really taking the data that's already there but forming new traits on, on how you actually get to the crux of the problem. One big one is age at slaughter, or what may be more appropriate is age at finish. Every day an animal doesn't have to exist or doesn't have to eat more and convert more dry matter into to methane um, is a good day for, for a carbon footprint. And an animal is probably at its weight anyway or at its finishing period anyway. So that extra day, that you can save getting it to finish has a huge, huge benefit when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas. Feed efficiency all is also another one. Feed efficiency you've got to be careful of insofar as if you have X amount of feed and you get more feed efficient animals, are you going to reduce that feed that's in your bunk? Or are you just going to bring on more animals to eat the same amount of feed anyway? Definitely in a pastoral system, if a farmer has X amount of grass and he improves feed efficiency over a few generations, the farmer is probably going to get in another cow or two because all that dry matter is still going to get converted to methane. So improvements in feed efficiency sometimes has no effect and sometimes have a, has a, a negative effect on a greenhouse gas. So you've got to be careful with feed efficiency and it needs to be managed correctly. Uh, changing the way we rank bulls based on carbon coefficients inside in the selection index. And this is what I'll talk a bit more technically about tomorrow afternoon. Um, selection index weightings, giving more emphasis to the traits that save you carbon and maybe taking a little pressure off those traits that um, would, would be carbon negative, let's say. So for dairy, milk production has a pretty big effect on carbon output. In beef, growth rate would have a pretty big effect on carbon output. So fiddling with the, the cost reduction or the emission reduction traits to give them more emphasis over and above the, um, the profitability traits. Fourth one would be looking at novel traits. And this is actually you know, getting away from the, the development of novel select, selection criteria based on the data we have and over and above introducing new weightings inside the selection indexes. And this, you know, the, the most obvious example here is methane yield, introducing that as a trait, collecting enough phenotypes on it, getting EPDs for it, and defining the exact trait definition of how you actually want to chase a reduction in methane yield. I'll talk a little bit more about methane and, and age of slaughter in, in the next few slides. Um, and also, if 
breeding for the future is 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 kind of a, a fuzzy one, but if you can have some peek into the future at what a system may be, are policy changes going to come down the line? Is there going to be quota? Is there going to be more premiums for a reduced age at slaughter coming from the packers because they want more carbon efficient cattle coming through? It's very important to try and see as far in advance, either subjectively or quantitatively, and see if you can, you know, get your herd ready for that um, future system if, if system change is gonna is gonna happen. Just gonna move through those. So I mentioned them already, but some of these core traits, the one, you know, so in in the objective of this talk was maybe to talk a little bit about the exact traits that we're interested in. So age of slaughter and methane yield are two huge ones that can drive it. Age of slaughter is a funny one. The data is already probably there, but actually when you go digging at the trait, and, and maybe people in the audience have done this already, and maybe it's an EPD, or maybe there's selection criteria on it at the moment, and um, maybe I've skipped over that part, but age of slaughter has a huge carbon saving potential. It's a funny trait when you start looking into it because it's all wrapped up in a contemporary group effects inside the normal genetic evaluation. So you kind of have to go back and look at your contemporary groups and break those apart because they're nearly defined by age at slaughter anyway, depending on how you how you form contemporary groups in genetic evaluation. Um, the, the the variances around the, this actually, if you if you go into your carcass evaluation and you look at if you include age at slaughter as covariate on, on carcass weight evaluation, look at the solution for that and look at the residuals from that. I bet you they don't behave as as you think they would. So, but. As a driver, it's not exactly analogous, or it's not exactly the same as carcass weight corrected to a day of age. So age at slaughter or age at finish would be a more appropriate way. The probability of hitting that sweet point in a grid by a certain day um, is, a, is a trait to, that holds a lot of promise. As well as methane yield, um, the, the amount of methane emitted per animal per kilo of dry matter that it, it takes in. Other traits that would drive uh, carbon savings are age at first calving calving interval, longevity, and feed efficiency. So uh, early paper, uh, Eileen Wall in 2010 would have highlighted a few different types of traits. She kind of breaks the traits down into three different pieces. One is the di direct traits. So that's something like methane yield. It's an actual measurement of gas coming from an animal. Um, another one is the traits that dilute uh, dilute maintenance essentially and area production traits there that's milk yield that's um fat and protein um production in, in dairy that's growth rate that's carcass weight in in beef so there are the production traits that dilute maintenance and that's really getting out emissions intensity and then the third type of trait would be looking mainly at the cow herd or those traits that facilitate more efficient systems, more productive systems. So longevity in the cow, she doesn't have to be a growing heifer. You can spread her growing heifer costs out over a long lifetime, or carbon costs that is, as well as her economic costs. So a lot of these profitability traits actually drive savings in carbon also, but you need to have a look at some of the, the, the relative emphasis of an economic relevance and the relative economic or the relative emphasis when it comes to a greenhouse gas emphasis is slightly different and you need to match those up. The promise of methane yield. So methane yield is essentially the amount of gas that comes from a kilo of dry matter that's eaten. And there's a lot of studies now at this stage that just show there's huge variation across any animal population or within any contemporary group on this. So, you know, if you look at IPCC, the International Panel of Climate Change, their advisory or their guiding metrics around that is, depending on the diet, it's about 20 or 21 grams of enteric methane emitted per kilo of dry matter intake. But when you look at the studies and you look at lots of different animals that form, that average, there's actually a huge coefficient of variation around that average. Um, you know, you see around that 20, you see a lot of animals between the 15 and the and the, the 25 grams. So even shifting that average in your population by one gram per kilo of dry matter intake, one gram, 10 kilos of dry matter intake per animal per day. So that's that's 10 grams per day saved across 365 days, across 20 million animals. Multiply that by 25 to convert methane to carbon. You're you're talking about shifting that average by by one 
you're talking about multi thousand kilotons of carbon saved per animal population in the 20 million animal population per year. So methane really has a, has a huge potential there, or methane yield. And there's different definitions of that yield. Um, your, your direct methane per kilogram of dry matter, but again, ratio trait. So we'll, we'll throw a residual at that. And it's the, it's the piece over and above that average of 20 that we're more interested in. The animals that emit less than what we expect them to are the ones that, that we're interested in. So some of the EPDs or some of the breeding values that we've been involved in developing have gone down that route of actually looking at the deviation from the average um, when it comes to a unit of what we'll put into the selection objective. Um, so Chaley Richardson, who works with us, did a good paper on that for, for the Australian dairy. Um, Jenny Price in, in Australia was her supervisor. She did a PhD down there and we were involved in it. So did a really good paper in Journal of Dairy Science in 2021. Um, by Richardson. Age of slaughter, again, I mentioned this, but what's the saving or what's the potential saving there if we reduce a day at slaughter? Um, one, it's, it's re if you go to accounting side of things and policymakers really just want the take home metrics or the take home stats from a beef production system, age of slaughter is going to be re easily recognized inside an inventory calculations. Meat and yield, not so much. If you try and convince somebody that, oh no, our population emits less methane for kilo dry matter than the average, they were like, well, you know, IPCC says this, we're not getting into all the nitty gritty of it. So meat and yield sometimes isn't um, recognized in the inventory calculations unless there's a lot of um, science behind it, petitioning, etc. Um, so again, one for the, the interest groups, but age of slaughter is, is um, really readily um, recognized inside an inventory calculation. So, you know, if an animal eats 10 kilos of dry matter a day, that's, if you reduce age of slaughter by a day of age, you're reducing your, your, your footprint in that animal by 200 grams per day, put that over 20 million animals. Um, and you do that once per year and convert it to, to carbon coefficients, you're mitigating about a hundred tons of carbon, a hundred thousand tons rather of carbon per year by reducing age of slaughter by one day. So age of slaughter one day, you could probably do it at the click of your fingers to do it effectively over a population, include that as a selection objective. You've got your carbon coefficient almost done there. That's a bit of a back of the envelope, but that's kind of how you think about doing it. It's a, it's a feed save type of thinking. Um, and you put your carbon price towards that and you kind of have a penalty that you can put on increased days of age or a reward on reduced days, days of age. So I'll be again talking about this more tomorrow, but putting this into the breeding objectives, if we think of a normal selection index and we think of EPDs weighted by economic weights and the weights being um, some calculation of economic value and, and discounted genetic expression. So a selection index would be a summation of EPDs by economic weights. Those coefficients or those B values there, you can weave carbon costs into those. If for every trait, you know what the carbon cost is for increasing each of those traits by one unit. And you can do that either through step-by-step -step analysis of resource changes or input changes per unit trait, or you can do like an LCA model. Um, if you have a whole system model and you start changing little parameters and you see what happens to carbon cost at the end, um, you can get at those, I'll, again, talking about that tomorrow. Um, you can weave carbon costs into your economic weights per trait. And then what you can start doing is you can either form carbon indexes or carbon influence indexes, or put it off to the side and start forming carbon sub indexes. Again, an, another, uh, another sub index for, for guys to worry about. But that's the kind of the thinking around how you do it. There's a lot of consideration of how you deploy indexes, how they're going to use them, what's the feeling from farmers or producers on the ground of how they'll use something like this. There's a lot of um, engagement encouraged when it's when you start doing things like this. Is it going to be too detrimental to production to start putting these things into indexes, or how do you go about them? I mentioned very quickly there carbon price. At the moment, when we're doing a lot of these studies and you, you look at carbon trading, et cetera, 50 to $80 per ton is per carbon is, um, that's definitely estimated to increase. 
if you actually want to facilitate or encourage behavior change, those carbon prices need to go towards $500 per ton, whether it's carbon tax on your vehicles, whether it's um, reducing a day's a slaughter that the packers are going to be penalized for. Where $50 to $80 a ton sits at the moment is just kind of a nuisance rather than facilitating or encouraging behavior change. So I think that price per ton is going to go up. And when we look at selection indexes and we look at responses to selection, at different prices of carbon, things start to change or bulls start to re-rank at a huge rate when it comes to prices of three or four hundred dollars a turn or five hundred dollars per ton. Again, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that tomorrow. Also in agriculture, a lot of other industries would look at agriculture and see mitigation costs in ag as relatively cheap. So you have a transportation company or an oil and gas company, and to mitigate a kilo carbon for them might cost them a thousand dollars. Where in ag, we're kind of doing it anyway, just by increasing production, you know, to get rid of a cow to mitigate the, the you know, 3,000 kilos of carbon per year for, that a cow emits or 4,000, whatever the US number is. Um, you know, if, if, if companies are paying massive amounts in their own business to mitigate that carbon, but they can buy it relatively cheaply off agriculture, then they will do it. But you got to be careful not to trade away all your benefits in ag, because once the, the accountant comes around or the national carbon inventory calculations come around, yes, ag or yes, beef have done a lot for the improvement of the greenhouse gas, but you traded it all to the, you, you traded it, all, your improvements away to the carbon company. So you've really just bought the, you, you've sold away, you've bought in the, the pressures of an oil company into your production and you're like, okay, you agriculture actually hasn't done anything if you trade away all your benefits. So you need to be careful if there's carbon trading comes in. Um, we'll probably finish up here. Some current examples that we've been working on and, and there, there's a few articles and, and publications out on it. Um, UK dairy, Australian dairy, New Zealand dairy, um, Irish dairy, Irish beef, Canadian dairy. So a lot of the dairy industries around the world have been on this. Lots of funding for development of this. We get fund, active funding calls across our desk daily. Um, the Greener Cattle Initiative, uh, Genome Canada has a call out at the moment. I thought USDA did, but the Climate Smart Commodities closed last month, but I'm sure there'll be others opening. And then the, the Global Research Alliance has fellowships uh, continuously to support. So to, to summarize quickly, and last slide, uh, approaches are quickly advancing for carbon selection indexes to, to, to put carbon, uh, carbon coefficients into selection indexes. Age at slaughter and methane yield holds huge promise. Selection index approaches to improving gross emissions and emissions intensity will differ. Um, the price of carbon will have a big impact on the relative emphasis of traits inside the indexes and databases. You know, lots of databases feeding into genetic valuations. Great point of audit, great point of tracking um, carbon footprints of the industry or of genetic improvement over time. So a lot, of, a lot of power in the databases that exist at the moment. Um, thanks again to BIF for the invite and thanks for your attention. Hopefully it didn't go too far over time and happy to take questions if, if there is time.